Hello, my name is Carolyn Aldershaw, and I'm talking to the author of Knights of Dark Renown, David Gemmell. David, what motivated you to become a writer in the first place? Well, I was a journalist uh, on local newspapers in the southeast, and around about 1976, I was uh, being tested for cancer. Uh, I'd lost about two stone in weight, was passing blood. Uh, pretty terrifying time. And my wife said to me at the time, you know, I was, I was off work, I had no energy. And she suggested that I should uh, do something to take my mind off of the tests that were being done. So I decided to, um, to write something, you know, anything, get to a typewriter and just take my mind off of the illness. And what I actually did was I wrote the illness um, as a fantasy. So I did a, a story that became the, uh, the novel Legend, which was a fortress under siege. So somewhere in my sub... It wasn't a conscious thing, but somewhere in the subconscious I was thinking of myself as the fortress. The terrible enemy were called the Nardia. Um, that was the cancer. And the fortress was being held by a small group of heroes. And I used all my friends as characters. Um, so the idea was to battle off the, um, you know, to battle off the enemy. So did it become like a form of therapy then, to actually write it out? Yes, it was, um, yes, it, it was a very strange thing. I only had two weeks before the results of the tests. Um, so it was a very short story then, about 50,000 words. Um, and I decided that if I did have cancer and it was uh, non-treatable, then the fortress would fall. And if I didn't, or if they could treat it, then the fortress would survive. So that must have been a very strange experience for you. Because most writers say that it, it has always been a burning ambition to write, but it was this thing that could have been such a negative occurrence in your life which actually started something so positive. Well, I had, as a young, you know, I was about 26 then, 27, and um, I had tried a couple of modern thriller novels before that, uh, but I wasn't very good at it, basically. So, you know, I'd given up and was sticking with my journalism. But this particular story uh, it kind of caught my imagination, and I showed it to a friend of mine, and she made some very, very positive comments. And I went away and rewrote it in 1981, uh, three times the length. And it was published in 84. So was this really what determined, in your mind, the, the route you were going to take with um, heroic fantasy? You felt this was going to be successful? No, it's, uh, it's a very peculiar thing. I mean, um, you know, publishing is a very weird business. What happens is you, you write a fantasy novel, and someone buys it, they publish it, and it's a big success. So when they ask, what's your next novel, they don't say, what's your next novel? They say, well, you know, what's the next fantasy going to be? You know, will it be set in the same world? And so, naturally, being a, a new young author, you then set another fantasy in that world, and that's a success too. And now, when people talk about you, uh, they say, "Oh, fantasy author, David Gemmell." And so that's kind of the route I took. Where do you actually get your inspiration from for these fantasy worlds? Because you create so many different ones. Well, someone gave me a, a very good piece of advice years ago, and it was um, never mess with the magic. Uh, I, know, I know lots of authors. Um, I've, I've spoken to most of my heroes now as well. And far too many of them start thinking about things like, where do the stories come from, where is the inspiration? They start talking about the, the, the well of creativity. And as soon as you start talking about things like the well of creativity, then you're talking about a finite source, which is why so many authors go dry. Because if they start thinking about the fact that, you know, where do these stories come from? How many will there be? Can I continue to do it? That's where you start winding yourself up. So I never wonder where they come from. I just switch my machine on in the morning, and I know it'll come. So if you don't put walls up around yourself, setting limitations, then, then, then the sky's the no, limit. There are right. no limitations. What about the characters? Where do they come from? Mostly they're friends of mine. Uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, I mean, a little story. One of my uh, most famous characters is a, is a man called Trust the Legend, and he was in the first book. He's been in three books since, and he's a, an old and grizzled warrior. And I based him on my stepfather. And as an example, the first time I met my stepfather, uh, I was six years old, and I'd been playing with a child in his garden, and we must have had a scrap or something. And I was being chased down the street by his, by his father. And this guy caught me, grabbed me, and he looked like a giant, the guy, because obviously when you're six, any adult looks very large. And he grabbed me and put me up against the wall. He was about to give me a whack, 
when this huge man appeared, I mean, absolutely massive, and he took hold of him, and he held, he, he held him up against the wall, and the first words I ever heard my stepfather say were, Do you know who I am? <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah, and this guy just went, of, of course I know who you are, Bill. You know, of course I do. And he said, Did you know I was walking out with this boy's mother? And the guy just melted. He said, oh, Christ, I didn't know, I swear to God. And he said, now you do. And the chap scuttled away. And so the first, first thing Bill ever said to me was, we better go home sometime for your tea. Now, to me, he was like Driss the legend. I mean, I didn't have a name for Driss then. But there was this colossal figure that had just saved me from um, a beating. And so I used him. You know, I used that memory, that six, the memory of that six-year-old to, uh, to create Rose. So that's the character. But then you can't call him Eric or John. They have these wonderful, wonderful names. So where do you actually get the names from? Well, mostly, mostly I invent the names, um, except for Knights of Dark Renown when I, I took them from the uh, Irish Laypaw Gabala. Um, had I known Druss was going to survive for as long as he did, uh, I would have given him a better name. You're not too keen on that one, then? Well, I know I am now. I mean, I love the old boy. Um, he's been very good for me. But uh, essentially, I was with legend. I was trying to create an old man who would, who was once a, a, a phenomenal warrior, who was now coming for this last battle, and everyone would rely on him, and he would die very quickly. And he would die very quickly because, in fact, he was an old man. It doesn't matter how how mighty you were when you were young. There comes a point where you can't do it anymore. And that was what I was trying trying to do with the scene. I thought, right, he'll come in, everyone will think, what a fabulous character. And then suddenly he's dead. Right at the first, you know, the first battle. But he wouldn't die. You know. Um, but that's another story. The, the point I'm making is, because he wasn't going to be in very long, I thought, what, what sort of name? And I worked with a guy called Russell Clawton. Russ. And I'm Dave. So I thought, Dave and Russ, Russ, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> it's as scientific as that. Yeah, and that's all it was. Yeah. But in Knights of Dark Renown, there's that really distinct Celtic flavour. I mean, there's there's names like Erin and Hrogafus. Really sort of conjure up those misty sort of Celtic times. But it's not Ireland, is it? No, it it's isn't. It's no. somewhere completely different. Yes, it's a complete fantasy world. So how long did it take you to write Knights of Dark Renown? Was it a long process? It's a, it's a peculiar thing. This it's a it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I remember once one of my uh, one of my heroes is an author called Gordon Dixon, and I met him at a convention when I was first published, and I said to him, "You, yeah, how long does it take you to write a book?" And he said, "Fifty six years." And I, and I stared at him and I thought, "What's he talking about?" And that's how old he was. And so, although the actual mechanical part of it you'll put together in five or six months. Um, Really, it's it's all your life experiences going into that work. So it's very, it's very, it's very difficult just to look down and say, "Oh, nights of dark round took five months to write." It's got all of you in it, then. Because it's got all of me in it, and so many things that um, one of the reasons that, that I um, that I wanted to do nights of dark renown was that uh, I was at a convention in Liverpool, um, and I had about four or five books out by then, and a young fan, who was a skinhead. Um, Came walking in, you know everything. It was the stereotypical skinhead. He had a, a Union Jack T-shirt, you know the braces, the Doc Martin boots, the shaven head. And he came up and he was enthusing about my books. And he suddenly said to me, "You know where it's at, don't you?" And then he came out with the most racist stuff, which he assumed I shared, because in fact there were no ethnic minorities in any of my works. And I came away from that thinking, no, 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 you know, I can't have this, I can't be getting this kind of following. Which is why I wanted to do the, um, if you like, the Holocaust story uh, in fantasy form in Knights of Dark Renown. And it came through very strongly, I think, because immediately I thought of the persecution of the nomads being very much the same of the, as you say, the Holocaust, the Nazis and the, and the Jews. So that was a deliberate intention, was it, for you to introduce that into Knights of Dark Renown? Oh yes, absolutely. And in the same way, when I wrote King Beyond the Gate, I had a, a black central character. You know, I don't. It's you know, I'm I'm not a racist. I don't hold extreme views. Now we discover in the book both heroes and villains, many many of them, but they tend not to be the stereotypes of the goodies and the baddies. 
Rather, it seems to me that they're individual displays of mixtures of strengths and weaknesses. Do you think, then, that within each of us there is a potential hero and a potential villain? Of course. I think that um, one of the things I'm trying to say is that I think what the, the problem with our race is that we tend to... Um, you know, we tend to think in heroes and monsters. We see someone, um, a serial killer, and we, we need to know that that man is a monster because that man cannot be like us, so we demonize him. We see someone do something heroic, and we think, no, he's not like us either, or she's not like us. Therefore, somehow, they become princes and princesses, you know, in that strange way. Um, so what I, what I deal with is um, I want people to, to see the banality of evil, and also, in some ways, the banality of heroism. Um, someone once said that, uh, by virtue of definition, only the coward is capable of the highest courage, because it's not courage if you don't fear. So when you get these fearless commandos leading raids, they're not brave. But you get someone who's absolutely terrified who leads that raid, uh, then that's courage. I imagine you must get to know your characters so well when you're writing a book, and that some of them become quite dear to you. So, in Knights of Dark Renown, who's your most favourite of characters? Groundsel. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, because he, for me, is, is kind of perfect. He's a, a flawed and tormented human being who, um, who then um, stands up to be counted. So I, I really did. I'm, I'm very fond of Groundsel. And Groundsel, along with a lot of your central characters, does actually get killed off before the end of the book. Do you ever regret the demise of any of your characters? No, I, I often say, you know, light-heartedly, that if I'd known Druss was going to be as successful as, as he turned out to be, I wouldn't have had him killed in legend. Um, but no, I, I never know who's going to die and who's going to live when I'm writing. Um, I let the book flow and just see where it's going. Um, Groundsel I, is probably one exception. I... I realised as soon as he became one of the new knights of the Kabbalah, I suddenly thought, this, this man can't make it, he can't get through. And I was quite sad by that. By doing that, by bringing in the human frailties, the, the limitations of humanity, if you like, are you actually trying to bring in more than just a touch of realism actually into the fantasy? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, like to, I like the books to be uh, as realistic as they can be within that within that fantasy world, um, but I also like I, I also believe that a good a good novel, fantasy or otherwise, should inspire the reader to do to do good. Um, you should be once you've finished it, you should be kind of uplifted. I had a, a letter from a fan, it pleased me enormously some years ago. Uh, he said uh, that he'd been out walking his dog, and he saw two men attacking a woman, and he went rushing in, and they ran off. And he was writing to me because he said that um, he just finished one of my books. So he was full of the ideas of heroes. And so he didn't think, he just went in and did. And, you know, he, he was just kind of writing to thank me. I wrote back and thanked him, because that's exactly what a good fantasy should do. Now, Knights of Dark Renown has got a very strong spiritual dimension. And there's that struggle of good over evil, which seems to run very strongly right through the book and also this quest of humankind to find harmony with the pursuit of colours. What religious ideologies do you draw upon to develop this aspect of the book? Well, I tend not to, uh, I tend not to concentrate on um, your in, in interviews on my own you know, spirituality, my faith, um, because once you say, you know, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm whatever, you, you kind of you polarise the, the fans thinking, oh, he's trying to put over Buddhist views, he's trying to put over Christian views. Um, what I'm really um, interested in is, um, is looking at, as you say, the, the overall, the good and evil, mm. um, the spirit in, in all of us, because it comes back to the heroes and monsters. We are all capable of monstrous deeds, and we're capable of great deeds. And so... Uh, but you having said that, there were strong things that came through... Um, when Nuada was, tre uh, was nailed to the tree and forgave Ramoth for being the one to shoot the first arrow onto him, you know, very strong t overtones of the crucifixion there, and Lamphada almost like a biblical prophet. Yes, it's, um, I mean, forgiveness and redemption uh, are recurring themes in my books. The philosophical and spiritual questions that are posed in the book are, are numerous, and, I mean, we've already said that the, the nature of evil is explored at length. 
Is this a deliberate intention on your part to use the story, to use the characters, to ex to explore these issues? Oh yes, absolutely. You know, as a journalist, I've um, I interviewed well over my career thousands of people, but I interviewed uh, gangsters, I interviewed politicians, I interviewed film stars, I interviewed people who were evil, you know, or had committed acts of evil. Um, you know, it, it just came to me. Um, so many of them, if they'd have taken one one small step in a different direction at some point in their lives, um, could either have become monsters or heroes. It's a fine line that divides. It is, yeah. There's a lot of violence in the book. Whichever side you're on, whoever you are, there is a lot of violence. Why? Well, we live in a violent world. I mean, one of the things that, um, that I think that we've got wrong, um, especially in the latter half of this century, and it's something that the Greeks understood, most ancient civilizations understood. You know, man is a violent animal. Um, we're a hunting, killing animal. And so all of these ancient civilizations developed stories um, to educate the young, mainly the young male, in a, you know, because that's where most of the violence comes from, into how to deal with that violence within themselves. So you have these, these stories of how the hero would always defend the city, would never uh, attack or... Uh, rape women would always defend the weak. You know, every hero that the child was hearing about was someone to emulate. So as that child found the violence developing in themselves, you know, testosterone, whatever, you know, they had that role model to hang to, you know, Horatius on the bridge, you know, Hector and Achilles, whatever. And we kind of lost that. And so in this particular generation, especially in the West, you look at movies now, and so many movies in the last 30 years have just extolled the, uh, you know, the virtues of power. Do what you want is the whole of the law. We almost got back to, you know, Aleister Crowley and the Satanists. You know, films where the villains butcher people all the way through and then walk away happily smiling at the end. And people watch that and think, oh, yeah, it's the way to be. So when I write uh, violence, I try to make the violence real. But I try to also ensure that uh, the consequences of the violence uh, are clearly seen. I'm glad to see that you don't also put women in the category of the screaming off-centre stage characters. They, they get stuck in just as much, don't they? They do. I've, I mean, one of the things I said when I was first published, I will never have one of those dreadful covers that used to appear in the 60s and 70s, well, I still do, in fact, where you get the male hero standing on the hill with, uh, you know, with his sword and kneeling beside him with her arms around his leg is some, you know, as you say, some screaming um, milkmaid. No, I can't stand that. I really can't stand that. But um, it's very difficult writing female characters within a, um, a medieval action fantasy because in medieval settings women did not have you know, a lot of rights. Um, and also, one of the things I've discovered with most of my female friends is they're great conciliators. And so when men will just react in that t testosterone or ch you know, charge, um, women don't. They sit back and think about stuff. Well, sometimes in a fantasy that's going to have lots of battles in it, the last thing you need is a conciliator, you know. So, in many ways, uh, a lot of my female characters almost become surrogate men because they are as action-charged as the men. But having said that, there are quite a few love stories threaded throughout the uh, the book of Knights of Dark Renown. And there's that particularly ill-fated one between Erin and Dianu. Would it be a fair accusation to make against you that you are actually a romantic at heart? Oh, I'm very much a romantic. I'm... I'm what you could label as a, a romantic cynic um, or a cynical romantic. You know, I I love the idea of honour and courage, and and yet I know from 20 years of journalism that 95% of the time the bad guys win. You know, that's just life. And the, there are people, aren't there, in the world who sort of stick their heads above the parapet and are often lone voices and this this came through in the book that loners are a particular characters that you identify with and and you like to explore their role in society yes very much so i mean i've always been pretty much of a loner myself i mean my my mother once uh, said to me after after a particular incident at school uh, actually I'll, I'll say what the incident was i was she loved books, and she used to get me to read all the time and read me stories. And so we just finished reading about a man called Thomas Newcomb and how he virtually invented the steam engine. 
and that James Watt improved it. And I was at school the following day, and uh, some, the teacher said, now who knows who invented the steam engine? So I put my hand up and he said, yes. And I said, Thomas Newcomb. And he said, no, nope. anyone else know? And of course somebody said James Watt, and he said, correct, good boy. And I then said, but you're wrong. You know, you're wrong, it was Thomas Newcomen. And so he, he then came me. He, you know, I decided to argue and he dragged me out front and he came me and uh, I got very upset. And I was talking to my mother about it later that evening. Um, and she said, that, what was it, the, the line she used was, a million people say a foolish thing, it is still a foolish thing. You know, never be concerned about it. Because the and also the class laughed at me. You know, because everybody knew it was James Watt. You know, and they were all wrong. You know, so that thing, million people say a foolish thing, is still a foolish thing. I've never been, since then, swayed by a, a mass argument. Somebody tells me if 95% of the British public believe in X, it doesn't make it right. But you do think that people can change their ideas, don't you? And that they can develop and evolve from the position that they're at. I'm thinking particularly of the conclusion of Knights of Dark Renown, where we've got Samuel Darach and Elodan, and in the end, it's Samuel Danak's own psychological state that defeats him, rather than any battle. You see, I'd argue there that um, that uh, Samuel Danach is is not actually defeated. I mean, that very last scene was, in fact, his victory, because there there was still, despite all of the you know the immense um, corrupt corruptive influence of what the original knights had gone through, he had suffered. Um, enjoyed whatever and that last spark of true heroism that was still flickering there he managed to fasten onto and so he allowed himself to be killed so it didn't defeat him he actually fought and because he was linked to all of his brethren he made sure in that last moment that their evil would be wiped out so it was his victory the great sacrificial act oh yeah now your new series of books is set in Roman Britain, and I know that you've written about this time before. What's your fascination with this particular time in history? It's it's more to do with, if you like, what, what the ancients used to call the people of stone. Many of the ancient tribes believed that there was a, a magic in the land, that we had joined to the land, that it speaks to us. And then suddenly along come the Romans, and they were literally people of stone. They put down stone roads, they built stone cities. They separated themselves from the land. You know, they were the first of the, the kind of technologi uh, technological races. And somehow, when you look back at those things, you see that the, the Celts had a great kind of spirituality, and the Romans had none. And what we've done throughout history is followed the Roman pattern. And perhaps we would have had a better history if we'd followed the Celtic pattern. I've read this book of yours, which is a, a fantasy book. Your new books, the Roman series, is obviously based on reality. Do you find that the two paths, if you like, of fantasy and reality actually can merge and cross over so that one becomes equally as fantastic as the other? Yes, I think, I think you know, when we look back on uh, history, there are, some, uh, there are some utterly fantastic things. But I think what I do, or what I try to do, is I don't like to deal just with historical fact, although I blend those in. I do... I do it as I think it ought to have been done, you know. I mean, it, we ought to have had the kind of heroes that I write about. Um, so that's, that's really all I'm aiming for. So you'd like to actually think that you're writing history as you would like it to have actually panned out? Absolutely. <laughs>